9th, 2006. I am Jessica Clark. It's a pleasure to conduct this interview for the Dakota Memories Oral History Project in Regina, Saskatchewan, in Canada. Can you please state your full name to begin with? Clara Catherine Ferner. And what is your maiden name, Clara? Al. E-L-L, -L. -L. Okay. yes. And where were you born? In Crono, mm -hmm. just uh, in a house just uh, outside of Crono. And when were you born? December 21st, 1933. So almost around Christmas time. Mm -hmm. Do you know any stories of your birth? Yes, um, apparently I was... I was premature. I was supposed to be born after New Year's. And my mother and father had planned over Christmas to travel to Regina, stay with his aunt until I was born. And I was supposed to be born probably in the uh, what was then the Green Nuns Hospital. It's the Pasqua now. However, um, mom went into labor after the 10 o'clock train. And before the 6 o'clock, she was no longer in shape to catch the train. Like, And there's no way. And it was in the middle of a storm. So, um, Dad had to, in the storm, go to Le Jord and get a midwife, Mrs. Cook, who came and, uh, and helped Mom, and also um, an aunt, uh, Aunt Katie L. from the colony was there and helped. And I'm, I'm amazed when I look at now some of our premature um, grandchildren, um, all the, the fuss they make in neonatal and, and, and all the machines they hook to them. Well... Um, they had nothing like that. Mom says the oranges froze under the bed, and they saved me, so it must have been some pretty skillful people. And uh, so I was born on the, in the middle of the 30s, on the shortest day of the year, in the middle of a snowstorm. Um, can you share with us some of your earliest childhood memories? Um... I remember playing with my sister, and we were about a mile up from Chrono, and uh, it was a pretty happy childhood. Um, nothing fancy. I remember one trip we took with the train up to Crobert one Christmas to visit Mum's parents. Uh, Mum. Um, Mom's parents, like her mother and her stepfather, had moved up there. And Mom hadn't seen her mother for quite a while um, because when she married my father, um, her stepfather did not approve. So there was a bit of a falling out there. But I remember this long train trip with my sister, and we each got a doll at, from the store at Chrono. Now, it must have been prearranged, you know, but it, um, that they made a big production about giving us these dolls uh, as we went on this train trip. And I remember uh, it was quite an elaborate, like they had a, a, what they called the Bilsenickel that came and, and frightened the children that they were bad. And, and, uh, 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 and uh, you know, but then, of course, there were candy after. So it was uh, all just a, a game. But to a small child, it made a big impression. Yes. So you said you took a train. Do you remember what the train ride was like? It took forever. Yeah, it took forever. Like now, in a few hours with the car, you would drive up there in probably less than three hours because um, that was just west of, Sask east, yeah, west of Saskatoon. And, uh, but then it, it was all day, you know, and as a child it seemed forever. But I remember the excitement, yeah. So at Christmas time, was Santa Claus a... I don't remember Santa Claus, no. That was St. Nicholas, like, yeah, the, the, a, a derivative of, of St. Nicholas, uh, you know, Bilsenik, yeah. How would your, um, besides this one you know, incident for Christmas, how would your family usually celebrate Christmas? I don't have any recollection otherwise, no. I, uh, yeah. It certainly wasn't the production it is today, yeah. You said that um, you were going to visit your grandparents. My did mother's you, parents. Did, did you get to know them at all? 
somewhat, uh, in later years, uh, they moved to Regina. And um, they, they both lived to quite an age. I don't remember exactly. I think Grandma was about 83, approximately. Uh, she lived the longest. I remember visiting her in Santa Maria. And, and uh, she was always a very um, elegant lady. Her appearance was very, and she would always comment. Yeah, and I would just chuckle to myself. She'd try and find something nice she could say about me. Sometimes it was the collar. <laughs> and I think, oh, I should have put on something a little more elegant to visit Grandma because she always noticed. Was she a farm farm? Woman? Yes, okay. yes. Do you know anything about their history? Did they come over from Russia? Yeah, or? Grandma was... Um, fairly young, and her mother died. Now, I don't know how many brothers she had. Uh, as far as what I do know, is she was the only girl, and uh, she, she ended up having to be the cook for, for a household of men. And uh, she talked about um, having to stand on a stool to make a, a big batch of bread um, because there, were, there wasn't a store around the corner, so Grandma... Um, had to learn how to do this cooking. And, and some neighbors, you know, or some other extended relative would come in and teach her how to do this. And so she had heavy responsibilities, and she so wanted to go to school. And even um, I, I remember visiting her when I was in high school, and she praised me for, for studying, that that was so important. She just would have loved to have gone to school. But because she was needed, her father wouldn't allow it. And uh, she regretted that in her old, old age that she could never, had never learned to read. But she was always a woman of dignity. And how about your grandfather? Well, he, he was my step-grandfather. I don't remember relating to him a great deal. He married her like he was her second husband. My, my grandfather, my real grandfather, Andrew Seiferling, died of blood poisoning when mom and her, my, my mother had one sister, full sister. She was five months old, and mom would have been something around, she was under two. And uh, uh, so in those days, uh, grandma had no way of supporting herself. And uh, he was the neighbor's son who came over and did chores, and so eventually they married. Yeah. And, you know, they had a big family after that. And I was thinking, I can't remember how many they exactly had, but I have about five aunts and four uncles, something like that, after, yeah, that are like half. But they're, they're close. I'm close to all of them. Okay. I know them all. There's quite a few in Regina here. Yeah. Did you get to know your, your aunts and uncles when you were uh, a young yes. kid? Yes. Yeah, especially, especially my mother's sister. Um, they lived uh, very close to us. In fact, they lived in Fourteen Colony, whereas our farm was not in Fourteen Colony. What was her name? Clara, the same as me. She was my godmother, too. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I'm still close to her. She's still alive. She's 92, living alone in her house. Yeah, she's quite a lady. <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit about what she was like when you were a kid? Uh, well, Aunt Clara didn't have any children for years and years. In fact, she had a daughter that was about five when we got, my husband and I got married, and she was our flower girl. So um, that was later in life, and uh, it, there was a health problem there. And uh, so this, this one girl, Marie, was uh, kind of a miracle baby, yeah. So Aunt Clara paid a lot of attention to me, and still does. Still brings me gifts. <laughs> what about any of your other aunts and uncles? Did any of the other ones live close to you? Um, <clears throat> well, my mother's one sister was a teacher, never married, and she was my teacher for, I believe, two years. And she boarded with us. So Aunt Madeline, uh, and she taught for... I believe 35 years and then retired and, and still lives here in Regina. So what was it like having your aunt for a teacher? 
Uh, it was pressure <laughs> because she did not cut any slack. She did not want to be accused of having favorites. And so uh, uh, we had to toe the line, my sister and I. We had to <laughs> be uh, right up on things. How far was the school from where you, where you grew up? Uh, about a mile, a little over a mile, because we lived kind of in the middle of the field. And I remember uh, driving to school in the summertime in a a gig, they called it, just a two-wheeled cart with one horse. Um, and like dad would take us mostly. But later on, when my sister and I got bigger, we, ha we walked. And we would, but of course, we'd have chores before school, like washing this dreaded separator with all these discs. And if you didn't wipe them good, they would rust. So then you'd be in Dutch with, <laughs> with mom. Um, and we had to uh, wash the breakfast dishes, and uh, and then we would have to. Uh, often we ended up running, cutting across the, the the pasture to the creek. It was about probably three quarters of a mile cutting across the corner. So what time did school start? In the morning? Nine. So what time would you have to get up in the morning to do these? Chores? I'm not sure. We probably were up by six thirty-seven. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, how long did the school day last when you were a kid? Till three thirty. Yes. Did you take lunch to school? Oh, yes. How did you carry it? I don't remember. Probably some kind of a jam pail. You know, later when uh, I was making sandwiches to my children, I used to tell them we didn't have plastic to wrap our sandwiches. Uh, you know, they would be dried out, you know, and, and just jam mostly, I think, and butter, homemade butter. I don't remember what we would have in that lunch, but yeah, we would carry it. So it, when you would have it in that pail, you would just put the sandwich right on in, no nothing that wrapped it? Paper, yeah, yeah. Wax paper of some kind. I remember later on that that was quite a, uh, an improvement when we, we got wax, uh, wax paper, yeah. Okay. Um, was this a country school, a London school? Yes. And how many, would you have the same teacher Every year, I mean, you mentioned you had your aunt for two years. But yes. Um, it, it varied. Sometimes a teacher only stayed one year. Sometimes you had them a couple. Probably not more than a couple of years, <laughs> I think, the teachers. You know, it had to be a tough job. I vaguely remember, um, I don't remember how I got my hands on some of the, the books from the... Um, School board, and I, I, but I remember looking up my aunt's salary, and it was fifteen dollars for a month. So that wouldn't even be a dollar a day. So when you said she boarded with you, did she yes. have to pay for any of that? Well, I imagine mom and dad would have charged something, or she would, or maybe they. I really don't know what the the arrangement was. Yeah. Where did she stay when she boarded with you? Did you have her own room? We, yes, she did. Yeah, it, it was a fairly big old house, and I, I have some pictures. And actually, it's the same house that I was born in, but also my mother was born in. Like, it was the, the original Cipherling house. And then because Mom and Aunt Clara were uh, the only daughters from that marriage, uh, they each inherited a quarter of land. So mom got, she was the oldest, I guess, maybe that's why, she got the, the, the land with the, the buildings on it. So did you like school when you were yes, a kid? Yes, I loved school. Was it something that your, your father and mother were very supportive of? They wanted you to get an education? Or? Um, I don't remember. I think... It, it wasn't a huge priority. I think they were proud when we did well. It was never a spoken praise that, you know, that now children are encouraged. It was more subtle. Um, and I think had I not had um, two aunts on my father's side who were nuns in the Sedley convent, I probably would not have been able to get high school. So I, I consider myself very fortunate. So you went... One through eighth at the country school. Yes. And then you went to the convent in Sedley? From nine to 12, yeah. Okay. So what was it like um, going to the convent for high school? Well, the first month I was homesick. 
but after that, I just loved it. I was very happy to, uh, to have the opportunity. And I read through their whole library there. Do you remember some of the books that you used to read when you were a kid? Well, I started with all the fiction in grade 9 and 10. And they had some really interesting books. But after that, I was so hooked on books, I read every spiritual book in the place. I, I do believe I read from end to end. So can you tell us what it was like living in the convent? Like, what was your daily routine? It was very, the routine was very sad. So you would get up in the morning go to mass and for uh i can't remember what grades it was we had an old priest who would come in kind of haphazardly for mass in the morning and so some mornings the bell would ring and father would already be there for mass so we'd be rushing out and other times we'd be in the chapel waiting and waiting and waiting for father father tennyson um he was quite elderly and so uh, i think he didn't have a clock <laughs> and after that we would have breakfast in school and then back to the convent for lunch. And then after school, often uh, go for a walk around what was called the 40 acres. And homework, the, the schedule was, and that's where I would read if I f finished my homework. Um, you had to stay in the study hall, um, I would read. And so I always had a book on the go. And uh, then we would have recreation time. And, and that was good to learn skills like knitting, like the girls would teach each other. And you could do embroidery or, of course, there was no television, but you would sometimes listen to the radio. I remember, I don't remember what year it was, but where Regina played in the Grey Cup game down in Toronto or Ottawa. I, but I remember us listening to this radio and some of the girls were all happy. They explained the game to us, to the rest of us that didn't understand. And uh, that was exciting. That, we did that one Saturday. We, we listened to this Grey Cup game uh, with the other, with the, the other boarders. And, uh, so, uh, and uh, skating. I learned to skate in high school. They had a um, hockey rink in Sedley. And Saturday mornings, all the boarders had a free skate. So we had this big hockey rink. And I just had this pair of ugly man skates. And I was embarrassed in the beginning because all these other girls had these beautiful white figure skates and they just looked so elegant. But it didn't take long. I realized I learned very quickly. And I, I guess they were good quality skates. My feet did not get tired. I would skate solid the two hours, and I just loved it. I felt like I was flying. And a couple of times, the nuns brought down some Strauss waltzes, and that was just fun. It was just pure fun, just skating to the music. What time would the day end when you were living, living at the convent? Oh, I'm sure we were in bed by 9 and lights out, I, I, I suspect, I can't remember exactly. We just did everything by the bell, not by the clock. <laughs> um, how often would you get to go home to see your family? Once a month. You know, and now that's such a short trip. People commute further than that. But that was a long trip in those days. So when you were going to, when you were living there, did you have a uniform that you had to wear? Yes. Can you describe what it was? It was like? navy and, and with a white plastic collar. Did you have more than one so you could wear different, you know, different days or did you have I just one? I don't remember. Yeah, I, I can't remember. Yeah. While you were at the convent, did you have like the, the daily chores that you had to do, like laundry and things like that or? Yeah, we had chores, like helping to set the table and um, helping to serve the food on the tables. I'm trying to remember, and washing the dishes, there was, you took your turns. I don't remember doing like any cleaning, like uh, mopping, or, and, and those beautiful polished hardwood floors, everything was meticulous. They had a janitor, I know that. We didn't ever help with any of the cooking. Did they have good food? Yeah, I, as far as I can remember, I don't remember, you know, the food was good. Can't remember ever not liking it, yeah. So, would you actually get your schooling at the convent? Or? No, no, we went to the next building 
uh, the, there was the boarding school and then the, the, the school was the building. And there would come day students from around Sadly into our classrooms. So those day students, did they also have uniforms that they were wearing? No. Oh, okay. so and there would be boys coming too. Okay. Yeah. So the boarding, the, well obviously the convent was solely girls. Were they, yeah. were they just 9 through 12? Or were they? There, they had a few younger ones, but not very many that, you know, would be out from too far. And especially if there was an older sister coming they would take some younger children, but it was maybe, there would maybe be eight or ten younger ones. How many people did the, the convent board? <sighs> hmm. Twenty, thirty? I can't remember. I remember my graduating class, there was about ten of us. Ten of us from the boarding school, yeah. I didn't mind. It was, in some ways, easier um, at home. We had more chores, heavier chores. We would be milking cows and uh, and the cooking and w scrubbing the floors. You know, so it 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 was uh, by the, the home standards uh, uh, leisure. Yeah, in grade eleven, my mother was ill, and my sister was in a grade younger than I was. And uh, she struggled a bit with school, so I said, you know, at harvest I would stay home and help finish the harvest before I went back. And um, uh, then mom, you know, because she, she, mom couldn't handle, and I, we had three younger brothers. And uh, then my sister, she decided she just didn't want to, she had a falling out with one of the sisters. And so we ended up switching, and uh, she, did, she dropped out. But today she's a gray nun, um, has her master's in social work. Like it's her, her story is, is another kind of story. Has the, you know she discovered after she dropped out of school had um, problem with her eyes, focusing. She had some surgeries, and that really she's a very intelligent woman. She has some business degree and some other, I don't know how many initials she has behind her names, quite honestly. So it's, it's really ironic, you know, how sometimes we judge somebody by how they perform in the classroom in this narrow environment. What's and your sister's name? Sister Jean L. Can you tell me a little bit about what your sister was like when you guys were kids? We fought. <laughs> we're very different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we fought a lot. And, you know, to this day, you know, we laugh now. Um, our differences are huge. And, um, but, but, and she's blonde, and, and I was dark, and, and she was taller than I was, even though she was younger. And, and I had to wear her hand-me-down, and I always tease her about that. However, like, Mom dressed us like twins. Like, we were uh, eight, seven, 19 months apart. And uh, I have some pictures, uh, umpteen pictures, where mom sewed us identical dresses. <laughs> but we sure weren't the same. Our skills are different. Our priorities are different. Are you close now? Yes. Yes. And I think we have come to a maturity of uh, respecting each other's abilities. Yeah. So you said you had three younger brothers as well? Yes. What were their names? Dennis and Leslie and Mark. Mark was only two years old when I was married. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so they, they, had, they were all spread out, yeah. So can you tell me a little bit, a little bit about Dennis and Leslie? Um, what you remember of them? Yeah, them? yeah. They, um, Dennis used to uh, <laughs> go out and get himself uh, into trouble, you know, if we didn't watch him, he'd be down into the creek. I remember one time on a Sunday evening, we were heading 
to some social event. It I, seems to me it was even back to church for some special feast, a benediction or something. Well, he had been all dressed up in the Sunday best and a little white shirt, and, and he, he had slipped away on us and ended up down in the creek. And <laughs> Mom had to end up cleaning him up before we, we could uh, uh, go, uh, go to, I think it was church. Um, Leslie was verbally very talkative, um, uh, and I remember even when Ben was coming to see me, uh, Ben would spend time with him, and he would just talk, talk, talk to Ben. Um, ben sometimes would, uh, remember one Sunday he went in to get ice cream. Of course, we had no refrigerator, so ice cream was a huge treat. So you'd, you'd slip into Regina, and we were closer to Regina at Richardson than at Corona. From Corona, you would never think of doing that. But from our farm at Richardson, which we moved to later, um, and Ben came home and mentioned after how he talked the whole way. <laughs> Just a little boy. And Mark, well, I didn't really know Mark. I, I remember babysitting Mark, like after we were married, Mark would stay with us. Mom and Dad did some traveling. And so I treated him kind of more like one of my own kids. So when, how much older than Dennis and Leslie were you? Well, I was born in 33, and Dennis was born in 39. And um, Leslie in 40, hmm. I'm not sure what year yet Leslie was born. And uh, Mark was born in 50. Yes, so and Leslie was born probably in, be well, maybe 45 approximately. Yeah. So let's um, talk a little bit about um, the chores that you had to do before you went to the convent. You grew up on a farm, right? Yes. So what were you responsible for being the oldest I, you know, it's interesting. When I was born, um, Dad barely had the, the horses put away in the barn. This is the story that is told. And uh, they sent out the message to him, it's a girl. And he was supposed to have said, oh, shucks. <laughs> of course, he wanted a boy. And so I often thought that's probably the reason uh, I was really small. I was driving the tractor for him. I don't remember driving horses, but he had this little tractor. And I remember we moved to Richardson when I was between 11 and 12. And I had done, uh, driven the tractor for him on the binder before we moved to Richardson uh, when, when he, he bought the, the, when he sold the quarter in Chrono and bought the land in Richardson. So, and, and I remember doing that kind of thing. And milking cows, like we milked cows really young. And, and mom like, was always canning, and we would be shelling peas for hours and hours or uh, washing out the jars. And, like, we just, it just did everything, gather the eggs, um, scrub the floors. I remember fighting with my sister. We would do the kitchen together, and we had this imaginary line in the middle of the kitchen. Well, of course, we each made sure we didn't reach over to the others. I remember one day, mom made us do the whole thing over because we had this strip of the kitchen. So we, uh, we learned after that not to be so. <laughs> so you grew up, you were born in 1933. Yes. So you grew up um, somewhat during the dirty 30s. Yes. How did that affect cleaning? Cleaning? Well, there was, I don't remember soap. I remember washing dishes without detergent. And it just seemed, I think everything was fried in those days. And the greasy water, and you didn't have water in a tap, and this water would get cold. It was icky. <laughs> and um, I don't know, probably we were just washing the floor with water. I don't know, I don't remember soap. I remember mom making homemade soap with um, lye and um, some rendered fat from, I'm not sure there whether it was beef or pork. It seems to me it might have been pork because I don't remember doing it. But I remember chopping up the fat pieces and it would be fried out. And uh, that would be used to make soap. 
So uh, mom would have these bars of lye soap, like lye was used to make it. Yeah. So when you would wash dishes, since you didn't have like dish soap, no. What would you? How would you wash dishes? With a cloth. You would, and and you you'd heat the water. Now maybe we use soap, but I remember the water being really greasy. I don't remember soap being involved in the process. How often did you have to wash dishes in a day? Oh, after every meal. Oh, yeah. After every meal. And that was always our job. And that was fighting ground. <laughs> because, what, you know, you'd make sure you wouldn't do more than your share. <laughs> um, who would do the cooking in the house? Well, Mom did, but she involved us very young. I remember Saturdays was cooking day. And she tried to motivate us by saying, um, well, I've got a feeling tomorrow we'll get company. So we would bake and make jello salads and, and make sure there was fresh bread and cake and uh, you name it. Like Saturday was major cooking time. And she was right, always on Sundays. And people knew uh, they could come to our house and there would be a big spread. And uh, that mom had open house. It didn't matter if it was a politician or a Watkins salesman. Whoever came by, they were offered a meal. So did politicians stop by your house often? I don't know. I'm exaggerating okay. there. I don't <laughs> remember. But uh, certainly they would have been, <laughs> knowing my father's, my mother's policy. When people stop by, would these, would these plan visits or would they just... Well, mostly relatives. Oh, yeah, mostly relatives. And they, well, the, mom wouldn't know ahead of time, most of the time. Like in those days, it was just, you would pop in. And mom and dad would do the same to other people. They would just pop in. So did you guys have a phone when you were growing up? Uh, later on, and of course it was a party line. Um, not very private. Everybody, but you know, everybody knew everybody's business anyway, so I don't think the party line. The nice thing about the party line was that if you ever had a problem, if ever you had a, a, an emergency, everybody was there to help, and they were. So how close was the, your closest neighbor? In Crono, approximately a mile. In Richardson, a little bit closer, about a half. How long did you live in Crono for? Till I was in grade six, the end of grade six, we moved in spring. Do you remember the process of moving? Oh, yes. Can you share that with us a little bit? Well, it was oh, a lot of work, a lot of turmoil. And um, I'll never forget, we moved on a Friday. And of course, the Catholic Church had this very rigid rule uh, of not eating meat on Friday. and. Uh, we get up to the new house, and uh, Mom had to rustle up supper. There was no picking up Kentucky Fried Chicken or pizza around the corner. Uh, all the movers had to be fed, and after working so hard. And Mom had a, a good supply always of canning. And she had the most uh, delicious fast uh, food way of doing like either beef uh, with somehow she made a gravy on it and put on dumplings. It was delicious. A, a, a canned beef, like in a, from a jar. And chicken, well that day she made chicken. Of course, because we were milking cows, you had cream and a few onions and she would make this cream chicken. Well, that's what she made for that supper. The next morning she remembered that she had served everybody chicken. Well, she felt so guilty. And my uncle kept rubbing it into her, <laughs> making her feel more guilty. <coughs> Take you to move to Richardson? Was it just a day? Or? Well, in my memory, Dad may have, when we were at school, moved some things up ahead of time, but I remember uh, the move being one day. Um, what had happened previously or what happened after, I, I wasn't involved in, but that day we were like that, yeah. What was it like for you switching schools? Because you were in grade six at that time, so yeah. you had to go to a new school. Yeah. I don't remember it being traumatic for me. Um, I liked the new school too and quickly made friends. How far was that school from where you grew up? That school was 
two and a half miles. And uh, there was a period of time where Dad had this very faithful horse that we would drive to school, turn the horse around because there was no barn at the school, and just put the blankets on it and send the horse home. And the horse, the horse would go home by, by himself. This was his faithful Judy. He used to brag about this horse. Then later, Dad got on the school board, and they, they did put up a, um, a bit of a barn there for and And actually, they put up a bit of a teacher each, too, at, at Richardson. So in the afternoon, when you were done with school, how would, would you have to walk he, home? He would pick would... us up. Okay. Yeah, no, I don't remember walking home the two and a half miles. And, and of course, in the summer, it would be with the car. Remember one time in the winter, Dad brought us home, and it, oh, we had had tons and tons of snow. And uh, I'm not sure what happened. Dad uh, drove at the, the bank in front of the house was quite high. And he, instead of going down, he, he tipped us <laughs> and turned the sleigh upside down. We ended up rolling out of the sleigh because on the snow bank, the, the, the sleigh tipped. I s kind of suspect he may have done it on purpose just to play a joke on us. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, you know, but yeah, I remember being dumped out of the snow, out of the sleigh. So it sounds like you were kind of close to your father. Yeah, dad and my personalities. Oh, we argued too as, when I got older. When I was little, oh, no way. But uh, the older I got, especially in his old age, I would uh, challenge him and he would challenge me. And, but we were never angry with each other like it would be. We would disagree and that was it. What was his name? John. And can you describe what he was like when you were a little girl? Dad was firm and opinionated, but it, it was gentle. I only remember once getting a swat on my behind, and it, it wasn't. Mom was the disciplinarian, actually. Yeah, mom, mom would make, especially when we were fighting, I think we drove her crazy. She would make us kneel, I think, for some peace of mind. So we'd be quiet for a while. <laughs> her two <laughs> battling daughters. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, dad, uh, and he, uh, he had a great deal of confidence in us. Like I say, make, you know, I drove the tractor at a young age and, and uh, my sister too. Like, and later on, we would truck the grain and uh, he, like I drove the car. I remember getting my driver's license. And I think that I might have been the first age group that had to be tested to get my driver's license. Like Ben remembers going, his father going and paying $2 or something and coming home and here's your driver's license. Ben had a driver's license. Well, I had to go in to the office. I had studied this little book and I had to write the test. And uh, then we had no idea what to expect. We had to uh, drive, and uh, we had an old Model A Ford at the time, and this was before signal lights. And this poor car, my father kept the motor running just tip top. However, the somehow the <clears throat> knob to the door, and you had to do it with hand signals, you know, and <clears throat> but the window wouldn't, you know, so I had to open the door. We weren't prepared, anyway. <laughs> And that was just the most awful experience, and I, and by the time and we had parked between two cars, Dad had parked. I had never unparked in my life. Well, by the time I and and the tester wouldn't let Dad unpark. By the time I got this car and parked, and I don't know how I did it without banging, but I didn't get out the my foot. I was so nervous, and the foot feed wasn't you know a steady thing. Well, I was shaking, and we were jerking down the street. I'll never forget that. I think that tester was really happy. So then, I, in order to get my foot steady, I was speeding. <laughs> oh, it was bad. But the next time, I, you know, then I got a learner's license, so I was able to drive in Regina. I just practiced a couple of times because I had driven that car out in the farm. Like, I was very comfortable. We, we parked on the end of the street. Dad had the window turned down so I could do my hand signals. And of course, I got it then with no problem. <laughs> so how old were you when you would go in? 16. 16. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, because Dad needed me. See, I, I did all kinds of driving chores for him. So he was glad when I was 16. And being the oldest did give it, have its advantages. You know, th there were things that, that I learned to do at an early age. Such as? Well, like the driving and, and like out in the farm, even uh, trucking the, the wheat. And, and uh, he would take me in the tractor and he would collect bales. And he would do the, the, the forking on. And I would drive the tractor from pile to pile for him. You know, those kinds of things, yeah. I don't remember driving the combine at home. I did later when, I, when we were married, but. So we've talked a little bit about religion, but not a whole lot. How important was religion to your parents? Very. My father, up at Richardson, um, sometimes in the winter would go and flag down the train, go to Regina. It was an all-day trip, just so that somebody in the family could get. And uh, there were times when he had have the car a few miles up the road, and we would catch, you know, go in the sleigh up to my uncle's and, and, and then go the rest of the way with the car in winter. Uh, it, they went to great lengths to go to Mass. Yes, yeah, religion was very important. So when you lived in Richardson, was Regina where you would have yes. to, go to go to church? Okay. Yes, yeah. Um, in Crono, where did you attend? St. Peter's, okay. yeah. And we still went back every year to St. Peter's, like say to the pilgrimage. Like that was, uh, that was a very important um, event uh, growing up as a child. The car, you know, even though our car was, was old, Old. It had to be polished and cleaned, and our shoes. And uh, we, Mom would often make us a new dress or a new hat or something. Like this was a, a, a big event. And looking back on it, we looked forward to it as um, I have to confess, as a social event. That's where our friends would be. Like it wasn't a spiritual event. However, I do remember sometimes sitting down in the grotto and. Um, a hymn or um, something, some prayer, or, or I remember to, um, the grass would be freshly cut around the grotto, and sometimes a, a breeze would bring in a waft of what now I know is, is wormwood. There's a very distinctive smell, and that smell has, 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 has become to me uh, a spiritual smell. Like I know, like incense is considered some, but for me, it's wormwood. That smell, um, and I would have that sense of the presence of God. And um, th that I remember sometimes just being touched. How many people would, would go to the, the, this uh, pilgrimage every August? Oh, it would be packed. There would be two, three, four hundred. I, I, you know, never really looked at numbers would have been easy to estimate that. And people would be all along the sides, like even if you would have, you know, counted the pews, it would be very difficult to estimate. Yeah. Do you, um, when you were at uh, Crono, the school that you attended, um, the country school, was that predominantly a Catholic school or was that? No. No, it was Lutheran. Lutheran and Catholic. And I think it probably was 50-50. And there was some, um, friction between uh, the two religions. There was, you know, unfortunately, looking back on it. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't terrible though. Like we had friends, but every once in a while, some, some little issue, Catholic Lutheran would, would, would uh, come up, yeah. So at the school that you went to, um, out there, was there any religious instruction going no. on? Okay, it was strictly a, a our religious in, yes, yes. Our religious instruction happened um, two weeks in the summer uh, at St. Peter's, and there we, you know, if, if you were a certain age, you'd be prepared for a certain sacrament or uh, yeah. So at St. Peter's, is that where you were baptized? Yes. Is that also where you took your first Holy Communion? Yes. Do you remember that at all? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I remember, you know, the white dress and the excitement. And I remember, you know, a bit of the teaching and uh, 
the wonder of it all. And, and then the confirmation too. And, and being a little bit afraid about the slap from the bishop. Back in those days, there was this little, you know, that was, you know. Well, you would get like, a like, like, yeah. And uh, I, I don't remember exactly the meaning. I think it was just kind of a warning. Or a, I, I'm not sure. I probably, because that certainly has changed in the ritual. At confirmation, did the bishop ask you questions yes. about scripture? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We were asked, yeah, and we had to memorize. The memorizing was very important. You had to memorize exactly the answers. Do you know about how old you were when you went through confirmation? Probably 12. It was, we were still living in Chrono, so it could have even been 10, 11. Because I, I think I was almost 12 when we moved, so yeah. Um, when you were growing up, were there other types of religious activities that you would participate in? Yes. You know, your, your whole social environment was either directly with church, and, and that's where you would visit after church or, or before church, you'd, you'd go, you'd be invited to someplace for lunch after. I remember, I remember one of dad's uncles would often have us in for soup and pie. That was kind of the, the traditional lunch then. And, uh, you know, and even the, the social events like the dances, the fall suppers, the card parties, you know, anniversaries were all with your church community. So that was your, your uh, entire uh, religious and social life was in that environment. And it, it all took place at church that was a whole. And uh, that's what kept the community together. Were the services in German at that time? Or? The Mass itself was in Latin. I believe the sermon, like now it's called a homily, was in German, I think. I don't remember paying a whole lot of attention. To, to that. The, the priest at that time, was he approachable for children or was he kind of... Mm, oh, you had, to, you had to be very... I remember one day going to the house, I don't remember what reason, and there was this greeting you had to give Galopsa Jesus Christus, um, praise be God, and you had to... Oh, yeah, you, you, you did not... I do have a picture of our priest um, in my first communion dress with two other children, two cousins. Um, and he seems fr like, he, he, I think he was friendly, but I don't think relationship to children was encouraged. In fact, he was the one that before church would question you on your catechism. And, uh, oh, there was many a child pulled out by the ear and made to kneel in front if they didn't have the right answer because from the week before, you were assigned certain questions. And your parents would um, have the responsibility of uh, making sure that you memorized these answers. How was the seating in church when you were growing up? Did people sit with their family? Yes. They did? Mm -hmm. Did the families have a, sit in the same spot every week? <laughs> yes. Yes, everybody had to, they, they rented their pew for a certain amount, and yeah. Um, how about names days? Were those something that was practiced? Yes, yeah, there? like my father's St. John's. I don't remember mom ever having a ce celebration, but oh yes, my father's Johannes, uh, t the 27th, or the day after... Christmas, right after Christmas anyway, we would always have a celebration for Dad's Names Day. How, do you cel how did you celebrate a Names Day? Well, people would, would come, or he would go to his uncle who was in the colony, and uh, they would serve liquor, and uh, especially after Christmas, the women had done all this baking, and especially for the children, uh, root beer, homemade root beer would be made, 
And uh, I remember helping to make that and bottling it. And uh, oh, that was a real special event. You would have Christmas oranges, maybe your nuts, and there would be some candy, yes. So how do you and make, singing. How do you make homemade root uh, You bought um, a little bottle, uh, and I don't know, it, it probably came from a plant. And um, there was a, a, some yeast and sugar went into it, and it would be mixed. And, and then bottled like in glass pop bottles. And there was special lids that uh, they would buy. And there was a special machine that would. And of course, there was a few, a few instances where the, uh, the amount of yeast perhaps wasn't um, mixed uh, equally or something. And you, you'd end up in your basement with a few <laughs> bottles, the, the tops coming off. And if you would bring these, you know, like any um, soft drink bottle now, uh, that if you shake it and open it, you're going to have this uh, fizz coming out. Um, you, you could do the same with the root beer. So um, these, were, these were very special. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that um, they would do singing for the names. Oh, yes. Well, and, and Christmas often there was um, singing and music, yes. Yeah. What was, um, how did the church uh, celebrate Christmas time? What were, how did, what were the services like at that time? Well, I don't remember them being different as a child. Like um, later on when we grew up, and, and you know, the neat thing um, was, and that was only after we were married, like Vatican II, it was really an interesting event being a product of the pre-Vatican II church and, and then living through the transition into the post-Vatican church. Um, that was exciting. And, um, but Christmas, vaguely, I remember the choir doing um, some special music that was, of course, in Latin, but in four voice harmony. I remember a couple of years before we were married, coming into our church here in Regina, in Little Flower Church, they had a violin and I don't know something else with the organ. And, and they sang a mass in four voice harmony. I thought I'd gone to heaven. It was a midnight mass and time stood still like it was like uh, it went on forever. I, I wish it would have gone on forever. I, I, it was uh, just very uplifting. So you mentioned that, it, that you really liked seeing the transition of yes. the church. What was it that you really enjoyed about that? What was so significant? Well, the oh, I could go on forever talking about that, but in a nutshell, um, the transition from worshiping God in the Eucharist, in the tabernacle, to that awareness of the presence of God being in my brothers and sisters, and that the body of Christ is also not only in the Eucharist, but also in, in, in my fellow um, worshipers. And beyond that, into my community, like everyone. And you lose a sense, of, like now you go into church, there isn't the same sense of the sacred. It, you know, there it was silence. You, you were hushed if you greeted anyone. Like, and so there was a coldness then. Like now it's friendlier. So you gain something in the friendliness, but you lose, like there was a sense of the sacred, like the, everything was solemn and the ritual um, really did give a sense of um, being holy and solemn. Today, it's friendlier, um, but there isn't the same respect and, and uh, so, uh, and certainly Latin, there was a mysteriousness about it. Now the vernacular um, makes it more meaningful. And I appreciate today, I think, above anything else of the changes is the openness to scripture. Scripture has become a very important part of my life. Growing up, it wasn't scripture. It was more memorization of questions and answers. And uh, so that has been important and broadened my, my whole relationship with God.
tell me what a funeral was like when you were growing up? Very solemn, sad, um, um, black, everything black. Um, and the music was sad. There was just a... Uh, Do you remember um, the first funeral that you attended? Yes. I don't know if it was my first, but the one that struck me. My father's sister, Clementine, who was a nurse contracted tuberculosis. And I don't know if mom and dad prepared us or not. I was quite little, but I remember being terrified, standing at the graveside. Uh, and, and I don't remember anybody comforting or saying anything that made sense, like just, and did we not, did I not express it to mom and dad or, or I don't know, but I just remember, I had nightmares. It was very frightening. How old was she? I would guess she'd have been in her late 20s maybe. Was there any other funerals that were that frightening for you when you were a child? Not that I can remember, no. No. Um, how about was anybody in your family seriously injured when you were growing up or ill? Dennis, my brother, had spinal meningitis, and I believe now it was from mosquito bites. And I remember seeing him in... Uh, we weren't allowed in the hospital, but he just kind of went rigid. And I, I remember th the feeling from mom and dad that they thought he might die. He was in the hospital a long time. Was he in the hospital in Regina? Yes. And did he, they were able to? Yeah, he survived, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 